figured it was right. a good idea for Chicago. All right, hi everybody. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another Modern Forager story. Uh, I'm here with Kristen Blizzard. Say hi, Kristen. Hey guys, good to see you. And um, we are here with Matthew and Tammy. That's Matthew Solano and Tammy Mencher. Say hi, guys. How's it going, everyone? Hey. All right, I'm just going to close my door. Keep the, the dogs out and hopefully have better sound quality that way. Um, right, and yeah. uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea on. before we fire this up and start like hitting you guys with questions and hearing about your story to just do a, a little advice for everybody that's on here. First of all, we have a chat and this is a great place for anybody to chat to us. I will point out it says chat and you can say all panelists and all three of us will see that and you can chat to, to everybody that way is a good way to go. Or you can chat to all panelists and attendees, which is probably even a better choice. And then everybody will see it, including the attendees. So if you wanna keep it private, you could just chat to the panelists, like if you wanna ask a private question and we will try to answer it. Um, we're gonna do a recording of this. So we'll try to make it available probably in about 24 hours after we, after we get this going. So uh, we're in Glenwood Springs right now. It's just getting dark outside. Um, tell us where you are right now. We're in Erie, Erie, Colorado. Um, it's, it's, it's been a fun little adventure out here, I'll tell you that. Where, where is Erie exactly? Erie is about 12 miles east of Boulder. Okay. Uh, and literally just above Lafayette, Colorado. Okay, so Boulder is kind of your 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 hub there for for you. I assume you you go into Boulder a lot. I do. Yes. <laughs> okay. We uh, primarily did a lot of our work when it came to the restaurant hospitality industry. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's talk about your background a little bit. Um, I, I know that you you grow a lot of mushrooms right now. And uh, but to kind of to kind of get there, you you've been foraging and you've uh, done a lot with indigenous foods, and you both have restaurant backgrounds. So let's start with the, the two of you and tell us about your backgrounds and especially how you got into foraging. I think first, um, foraging actually started for me back in I think it was like 2005, and I was out camping and I just got interested in the food or in everything that was around me because I noticed that there were raspberries growing on the mountainside. And next thing I knew, it just kind of blew up. I started finding all kinds of different things and researching different plants. And eventually we ended up doing mushrooms. Uh, foraging for me actually started, um, I would say when I was able to walk um, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, we would harvest prickly pears and creosote and things of the desert. Um, I think I got more involved in it in one of the most unlikely places, uh, a fine dining restaurant I used to work for in Tampa, Florida called Burn Steakhouse. And it was actually one of my uh, third nights and I was the new guy. So I was the guy that got pulled off to the side and they literally dumped like uh, 50 pounds of morels in front of me to ask me to clean them. And I'm like, wait, where do these, you know, where do these mushrooms come from? And they're like, they're forged. I'm like, what are you for? This, you know, this is a fine dining restaurant. You know, and we're, we're serving, you know, 200, 300 dollar steaks. And I'm thinking, wow, we're, we're collecting stuff from the forest here to serve in this really awesome restaurant. And it piqued my curiosity. And that's when I um, really got more involved in looking for opportunities, chanterelles, morales, and those, those natures. And yeah, not in Florida, though. Not in Florida. No, that was, that was actually a transition. I had uh, scooted up to North Carolina for a while and studied a lot of barbecue and got to hang out there. There's not really where I was. Uh, there was, I believe, chanterelles kind of grew up there. Um, but there weren't any really good bull leaves, which is what I was primarily interested in at that point in time. Not that I know of. I would ask the locals to take me out and whatnot, or I would go out by myself. I didn't want to get too lost out there, though. Okay, now, I just got to stop you. I hear some beeping in the background. It sounds suspiciously like an ink bird controller. It, 
Go ahead. It's our humidifier uh, alarm, actually. I reset it. Uh, we decided to do our humidity a little bit higher. So because it's a little higher, it's going off right now. Yeah. It's yelling at us, telling us that, you know, we need to fix something. I, I'm very familiar with that sound. It, 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 it beeps away. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. It, uh, you know, it's, it, to me, it's, I can almost take a nap to that sound. It's almost comforting, you know, knowing where my settings are at and, you know, how everything's going in the tent, just, just by certain sounds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, sorry, I had to jump in there because that, no, no, that, 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 noise was, that noise was familiar. So how, how did you get to Colorado then? Uh, for me, um, well, I did a lot of traveling around. Um, I jumped, you know, out of high school, I jumped right into traveling because I knew I wanted to cook right away. And um, you can only really learn so much in Tucson, Arizona back in the 90s, honestly. Um, Tucson was really into fatty foods and big steaks at that point in time. And uh, or, or lots of fried things. Farming and uh, cultivating um, anything healthy was definitely not on anyone's priority. And I wanted to learn and expand my horizons a little bit more, I would. Um, go travel. Colorado was one of the places that I really loved and chose to stick around here. Yeah, yeah. Have, have you uh, gone back and done much foraging in Arizona? I have not, actually. I really wanted to do that, and I know that you were actually doing a webinar about that um, a couple weeks back or about a month back, and I wanted to get onto that. Unfortunately, you know, uh, life happens, and I couldn't yeah. get But um, when I was a kid, um, I found a patch of morels, and I didn't realize that they were morels in two, you know, as a kid. And they kind of weirded me out because they were the ones that were side fruiting in like a hole um, covered with some pine needles. And, I, and I, I forget what that phobia is where you're afraid of shapes, but it really like shocked me when I was little. So I've always kind of wanted to go back to Arizona and do some foraging and kind of hang out. We just haven't had that chance yet. Yeah. Well, wait, wait till it rains some more. It's a really uh, that and that that webinar is on on YouTube. Uh, we recorded it with Chris May. He he taught that a really good webinar. He taught. Um, you should go check it out and go down there when it when it's raining. I know we've been wanting to go down all lot this spring and this summer, but the weather doesn't cooperate. And and you know when it's dry in Arizona, it's really dry. Oh, it is. And, you know, it's, I constantly hear, well, at least it's a dry heat. I'm like, well, okay, that's, you can't tell when you're evaporating is basically what that means. <laughs> Arizona, when it's dry, unfortunately, there's, there were lots of wildfires down there, um, like there were here. And um, it, it saddens me a lot, but Arizona, when it's green after it rains, it's one of the most spectacular things on the planet. Yeah. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. There's life coming out of every nook and cranny that you would have never have thought. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, well, how, how then, how, how did your stories kind of come together? Did it happen here in Colorado or, you know, we've kind of heard a little bit from both of you. Where did you, where did you, your stories join? Uh, well, I was born in Estes Park and kind of raised in Boulder County. So I've always been in Colorado. And when I was a crazy teenager, I used to go and run down the mall and go hang out with my buddies. Um, it turns out that during that time, Matt was actually working at the Cheesecake Factory. And that's how we met. He, was at, he went outside to take a break and I ended up talking to him. Hmm. That was over 20 years ago. I opened up that Cheesecake Factory um, back in 98. I was one of the original grill cooks. Down recently, I was almost kind of sad about that. It was the one on Pro Street Mall, but that's how that's kind of how far back I go. That that was actually when I was a younger cook, and at that it's interesting because at that point in time, I didn't cook anything else other than a portobello. I was coming out of uh, bar and grill phase of my cooking experience and entering a different realm. I know a lot of people look at the cheesecake factory and go, "Really?" I'm like. At that point in time, we made everything from scratch, and it was exactly that factory. We all worked together to put that food together. 
as time went on, he ended up going to Florida. I stayed here in Colorado. Uh, we met back up in 2011 and then started our whole journey back over again. When did you guys find your first Porcini together? Uh, that was what, 2013, 2014? Yeah. Summer of 2014, I think. I, uh, I looked at her and said, I want to go up the mountain to go find some Porcinis. And she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> uh -huh. He was, she was like, I just worked a 12 hour shift. We finally have a day off and you want me to do what? And I'm like, yeah, so let's go. And uh, we did. And uh, of course we, you know, you find one here, you find one there, you get excited about it. And then you take them home and you cook them and you're a little school kid and you're like, look what we found. And she's looking at me like, are you sure we can eat these? Are you positive? <laughs> I want like 10 confirmations on this. I'm like, just trust me, I'm not gonna kill you. And so um, I got to cook them for her and you know, show her the flavor of her backyard of her land that she was raised with. And um, we went up the next year and we stumbled onto 50 pounds of porcinis. And ever since then, she looked at me and said, let's go porcini, honey, uh -huh. oh, let's do this. I'm not sure which one of us likes, to, you know, drags the other one out the most. Uh, it <laughs> almost become a, hey, you know what I'm thinking? And she's like, yeah, let's go. Or, or vice versa. Yeah. We, 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 one, we rarely rain on each other's parade when it comes to going out to find mushrooms. Are, are you guys the same way? Do you go out together and, and hunt together all the time? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, except for one of these last times, my son had finally found his first morel and he was super excited. But uh, we went looking for more morels because we found one. And uh, my son and I ended up disappearing for a second. So now we have to make sure we check in with each other a little bit more often because we were missing for about, what, 45 minutes? Yeah, it gets, you know, <laughs> it's the spots that we go to, um, we tend to go above and beyond the call of duty. We'll do some back. It's, it's my philosophy that. I haven't really put in a good day unless I'm bleeding somehow, so, you know, uh, from tripping over stuff or whatever, crawling through bushes. So we tend to hit those 11,000, 12,000 foot, uh, you know, summits. we tend to be in some bear family's backyard. I think mm -hmm. time over a mile marker 40 off the peak to peak, there was a juvenile mountain lion kind of hanging around looking to see what we were doing in his backyard. So uh, if people disappear, then I get a little bit nervous. But other than that, we know we know these hills pretty well. Yeah, you know, we we, um, we always take um, with us little inexpensive, cheap, short range walkie talkies, um, and I feel like those are our most important safety device. It seems like no, it, they work great. Yeah. Um, and now I think I don't agree with you on people. that. Yeah, I like to give them when we take people. I, I feel like. Usually it's the person we're bringing that I'm worried about losing, and I make sure that that person has one as well. And, and I love the little walkie talkies. Oh, definitely. Some of our um, uh, more, more sacred family spots, like uh, you know, maybe off the peak to peak on you know some of those pull-offs, um, we know them pretty well, and it's almost like our backyard. And we'll yell oi or whatever, kind of do it the rustic old way. Yeah, old school. But um, we're, we're expanding now when we're mapping out new territory to kind of go and hang out in. And uh, I think those short uh, wave walkie talkies are going to be perfect. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Give me just a second, guys. We just had somebody uh, ask how to get in uh, to this. They're having a hard time getting, uh, sure. getting, getting logged in. Um, let me see if I can. Help with that. Did I unplug that to control that BP? Is that going to drive people crazy? It's all right. Uh, I would, don't worry about it. Um, well, that's kind of hard to do on the fly to send somebody a link to the Zoom webinar. Um, yeah, Kristen, if you can do that, I think if you can just post in the link to from the uh, Facebook uh, invite, that that should work. I don't think that we're streaming right now. Um, Live. I don't know if that's working. Uh, yeah, and I will send you a link. Let me do that. Here it is. Here's an invite link. All right. Sorry. I think we're good. Hopefully that'll get out into the world now. Um, um, so, 
you guys started started you know 2013 finding porcinis and you're working in restaurants um uh, i think i think there's a couple of interesting threads we, we want to really find out more about you um one is the uh, idea of um kind of indigenous foods and what you do there the other one is foraging and then the third is cultivating um which one of those three areas do you think we should talk about first well i mean it's uh you know Foraging, I think we've kind of touched on that. Um, with us, foraging isn't necessarily something that we plan to do. It's just that when the spring hits, we're already packed and ready to go. And, and if we don't do it, um, it unbalances us. It's, it's mm -hmm. something that, like the whales migration, that just comes naturally we want to be up there finding fresh ingredients we want to be up there with nature um it can, takes us out of like the, the city environments and the rural um the suburbanite environment out here and it puts us in our own element um where we're at you know at peace with nature and so that's kind of just one of those things that we do as part of our lives that we don't i don't think we could live without doing it I are there I things other than mushrooms that you really love to pick? And, and eat? I definitely go after the mountain strawberries. They're one of my favorites. I call them mountain berries, but I guess they're called watermelon berries. I think they're watermelon berries, yeah. Um, but they produce what a couple of weeks ago they were out and about. And uh, the raspberries that I grab up, the raspberry leaves, so I can make raspberry leaf tea. And I kind of go all out. There's a, a type of yeah, currants. There's a type of quarters that I like to pick that I add to my uh, my salads in the springtime. Okay. And it, I'm pretty diverse. I like to keep a diverse food picking. We've done did a lot of. Uh, we always do a lot of asparagus. Is probably our our favorite non mushroom. And and uh, this year we really went after uh, nettles. Uh, when we couldn't find the morels, we kept finding nettles, and we, we really like those, too. Oh, yeah, I love nettles, yeah. Uh, I have then, come across a patch of those, but I will, and as soon as I do, I'm going to make a whole bunch of nettle pesto. Like, that's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. That's what we do with it, too. Kristen makes some, some good pesto. Um, we have uh, Linda McCormick has a question. In Colorado, is there an elevation range that is better for finding mushrooms, or does it depend on the type of mushroom? Uh, she said, I'm new to Boulder County, and if it's so dry here, I'm wondering where, where best to find mushrooms. And I'll, I'll let you guys start on that one. Uh, what, do, what, do, what, would, what would you tell her in Boulder? It really does depend on the type of mushroom for elevation. There's so many different variations. Like down here in Erie, I find oyster mushrooms all the time. We found a uh, puffball actually out in Longmont a few weeks ago. And it really just depends on the rainfall that we get that year and what type of mushroom we're looking for. If we're going for the porcini, we're definitely climbing for that one. Yeah, yeah, it's um, for sure. It's elevation with season. Yellow morels down around the creeks and the riverbeds, and you kind that's of like, that's like May, early June. Yeah, it's May, and then you start working your way up in elevation with species of morels and. Um, different oysters popping up as the time goes on. Rain has been horrible this time of year around the front range, the fires, over the smoke here in Erie. Um, I, we found one huge porcini, but we haven't been able to get out as much this year because of setting up our grow operation and really getting it going. Um, but the, the few times that we were able to get up you know, we only found a couple morales, but we found mostly rose hips and stuff like that. Um, one porcini cap, and honestly, I think a moose came, or a porcini, I think a moose came along and ate most of the stem or something, because like, it was, you could see the teeth marks. I'm like, well, they got me on that. Let's go back down. <laughs> it was a bad, bad year. Uh, but, I, and, and I know we, we usually go high elevation. We love the porcini and chanterelle at 10,000 feet or higher. Um, um, and, and I think we do start lower, but we're really waiting for middle of July, or early July to go up. Do you, do you guys have chanterelles up there very often? Our chanterelles up there, we've actually found some. And um, I actually, 
I bought some the other day off of Encel Farm and Forge that I, I, I cooked with this dish. I think, I'm pretty sure you got them in Colorado, um, but people find chanterelles um, up in these hills all the time. Okay. I've never really hunted there near Boulder, so. Uh, I think somebody found a blue chanterelle, I think in Gilpin County. Yeah, it was Gilpin County, yeah. Yeah. That's that's on our list too. Uh, yeah, Kristen said we, we only found three porcini this year. That sounds about right. That was a, a tough year. That's um, bogus. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We travel around a lot though, so we were able to get our fix in some other parts of the country. Thank, thank goodness. I saw that. Yeah, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're web designers by trade, so it's kind of easy for us to hit the road and, and work while we travel. Um, as long as we can get a cell phone signal, a little Wi-Fi, we can we can follow the rain a bit, which is, which is nice. Yeah, that is, that's, I, I envy that. Um, I got my head buried in cultivation right now that just kind of, it just became an obsession. You know, let's talk about that. Um, I love to cultivate. Um, I started two, three years ago. Um, and I've got a lot of, I, I do a lot of different species, but I don't do much of any of them. I'm, I'm not like a, a commercial cultivator. Once I grow it a couple of times, I'm kind of like, yeah, that was fun. Um, and I don't do it much in the summer. Um, really, I don't do it at all. Um, and, and the reason is you kind of have to be there to tend your crop. And uh, yeah, so tell us, tell us about your cultivation operation. Sure. Um, well, um, it started out uh, about three years ago. I went to go see a mycologist named Jim Stack, and uh, he was doing some inoculating uh, kind of uh, class to introduce people to mycelium. And I had my kid Jason with me, and I guess having a kid with you is a ticket to free spawn or something. But yeah. um, at the end of you know the, the hour, after you know he told us some basic things about home with coffee grounds and whatnot. We ended up with like over a quart of pohu spawn, blue oyster spawn. Now, my Jason's got his handfuls. He's got them all portioned out in these uh, bags. So we get home, and then we start digging out coffee grounds. We start hitting up Starbucks for coffee grounds and whatnot, digging out cardboard boxes and stuff at work for from our work dumpster, our recycling, and so we. We did this basic uh, pasteurization with the um, cultivating side of or the inoculating side, and we grew oyster mushrooms. And Jason and I looked at each other, and Jamie looked at it, you know all three of us are just kind of staring at these mushrooms <laughs> as they're growing. And we're like, this is really cool, and I want to do this more. Mm -hmm. Jack came over and ate them. And uh, the next morning, I found the disaster of scattered mushroom pieces. And I looked over at the cat, and he's sitting over at me with this proud look, like, where's, where's the rest? And I'm like, I knew at that point I wanted to grow. So um, I, I got a little bit more lesson off of Jay, probably some more basic uh, inoculating techniques. And then we started ordering spawn, um, and it kind of evolved from there. So did you start, you would order spawn, um, and what would you do with it? What was your kind of early, early Well, the very, the very first one he did was in the class, and it was a straw bag. He did straw with an oyster species. And then when we started ordering our spawn, we switched over to hardwood fuel pellets. Mm -hmm. uh, we were lucky, and there was a mushroom farmer who was actually leaving state. He was all the way down in Colorado, well, west of Colorado Springs. So we're able to get some wood pellets to uh, to start our experiments. Uh, next thing I know, we're growing chestnuts, oysters, lion's mane, and they were kings. Kings, right? yeah. And kings. All of we were like really new at this, and actually, the reason why we drove down there is because we had like a hundred bags of wood pellets, and he was selling them really cheap. And I'm like, well, let's go down there. Let's go talk to this guy and see how much we can come back with. We had a, uh, uh, what was it? A, a forester. A forester at that point in time. And uh, he was like, oh, cool. So, well, th thanks for picking up all these pellets off me. Do you guys want a bunch of spawn? I'm like, oh, okay, sure. So he started handing us like 10 bags 
of spawn and we, you know we're just loaded up in this car driving back home with like this whole mushroom growing the you know with just startup basically yeah and it just and then it just ballooned from there i got so excited coming down and checking out my little makeshift grow tank as you know we only had a couple species it was only a couple blocks each and uh, I would come down every morning super excited to check on the humidifier and see the little baby mushrooms growing and it just filled my life full of joy. I just wanted to keep doing it. Okay, well, how do you do it now? What's your, um, what's your system? Well, now it's on a makeshift grow tent. It's this giant thing sitting right behind us. It's a gorilla grow tent. It's a nine by nine. Um, now our couple of blocks per species has turned into anywhere from 18 to I think as high as we've gotten is 35 species. Um, and then, you know, it's just, it's just keeps growing. Now we're not ordering spawn, we're ordering liquid cultures mm -hmm. and then doing our own spawn. And here soon, actually within the next week, we're going to start learning how to do our own liquid cultures so we can cultivate those as well. Cool. Actually, let me just, put this out there for anybody that is dabbling the thought of cultivating mushrooms, just know that things escalate quickly. <laughs> Especially um, when you get on these Facebook groups and you guys uh, got everybody, um, you know, hanging out. They've already made certain advances. And so um, they start Prestos and pressure cookers and flow hoods or building your flow hoods. And that happened. So I'm going to let you guys, we did not know how to grow grain spawn five months ago. And we learned right before a farmer's market came along, which is an interesting feat in itself. And um, so with this, just know that the, ex the costs are going to be right up front extravagant but in the long run it's going to be worth it. Uh, green spawn you're able to get if you want to put out the money. It's already inoculated grain. The, the mycelium is already completely taken over. People's uh, genetics that's you know that's their genetics, their commercial strains. Um, you know they make they, they harvest the species out themselves. With liquid cultures um, you're, it's a liquid media, um, what is it, malt and uh, dextrose, and uh, the mycelium is actually growing, um, and you grow it, grow it, grow it in that liquid media so you can inoculate the spawn and grow as much as you need to, and you can even expand. Um, we actually talked to um, a professional um, mycologist, uh, mushroom uh, cult. Um, he's part of the Mycology Association, and he is going to be helping us do our own liquid cultures and do um, take spore prints and then transfer that on our agar plates and start out that way. I'm going to continue to buy other people's genetics because they're, they're the professionals at it. I just want the ability to harvest some mushroom out in the wild and bring yep. it home. Yeah. And, and so liquid color. culture looks like this. This is how you get them if you buy them. Um, even when you're producing your own and you need to get them into grain, uh, this is what you would be using. So this is what a liquid culture is. Mm -hmm. And one of those, you could do That's what? 20 right bags? I don't. <laughs> 20 mushroom bags from one of those? Actually, it depends. Um, where, where we've been taught techniques that you can keep expanding this we like to keep the genetics strong um, we don't like to expand it too much so we we only go as far as expanding it um, grain to grain transfer two to three times at the most depending on the species oysters yeah you know, we tend to do a little bit more they have that more of that wildness to them so their genetics tend to stay a little bit stronger but potentially i mean i think we, we've gotten what 50 bags out of it uh, it was close. It was 40. Yeah. So you can stretch that a long way. One of those syringes you can keep expanding and stretch it quite yes, a ways, exactly. kind of frugally. Okay. Yes, sir. Where, where, oh, do you, we where do you get your um, uh, syringes from? Right now we're getting them from the Mycelium Emporium. Yeah, me too. Most, mostly. Not always. 
Um, yeah, exactly. Lenny's great. He's been doing it forever. I mm -hmm. trust his experience. None of his cultures have ever, uh, you know, failed us. And the, the man knows what he's doing. I wish I had his knowledge, honestly. Um, some Sometimes um, we'll meet up with uh, other people. They're like, hey, check this out. I got this for you if you want it. Um, we met up with um, Miyako, um, I think that's her name. Um, she actually gave us, she harvested a blue it, field blue it out here near Erie in Louisville. Oh. And so we are going to take that uh, field blue it and we're going to get a tissue um, sample from it. And we're going to practice our agar transfers and, uh, and uh, making liquid cultures. Blue it's are one of my favorite mushrooms. I don't know if you guys have ever eaten them. But as anyone ever gets a chance to eat those mushrooms, they have a really nice texture to them. They hold up in cooking, nice umami taste. Nice, yeah. Yeah, except you kind of got to grow them like outside in your lawn, don't you? Yeah, you can. Those are, as far as I know, those aren't sawdust. Uh, the, you have to prepare wood chips and all that a year. And that's not a beginner species. Yeah, pine needles and, and leaves and a big exactly. pile of compost out in your yard. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things that we like about all of this is that all the different species of mushrooms have their own little quirks to them. They have their own little personalities. Mm -hmm. We discover that real quick when you're watching the mycelium grow and how it's growing. Um, especially with oysters, they're vicious. And we just inoculated some shiitakes, like, I think, what, just two weeks ago? Uh, a little longer. A little bit longer than show that. Show us that, yeah, show us what you're looking at there. And our bag is already going through this metamorphosis called popcorn. -y. Yeah. And the shiitake takes over the whole block. These are 10 pound blocks, unsupplemented. We find that shiitakes generally don't care about the supplement. A lot of people put bran and uh, some other things in their blocks to kind of help the uh, mycelium expand. Um, with shiitakes, we tend not to because they grow on wood. That's what they like to eat. And obviously, they have no troubles eating the blocks. So after a while, they go through this metamorphosis called popcorning. And the more they do that, the better. And they start turning, you know, kind of a blackish color. And it's parking up basically, that's what the term is called. And when I first started doing that, I almost started crying because I didn't know it was supposed to be that. <laughs> I'm like, well, why can't I grow these things? I really love shiitake. No, if you're gonna attempt to grow shiitakes, just know that the bag is gonna do some weird things. Watch gremlins and you'll get kind of a clue. And my, when I did that, it took like, shiitakes took like two months in the bag like that before I could even put them in my fruiting chamber. It was a uh, it is a three month process for me, and maybe it was just the kind I was using. I think we kind of did like an over inoculation on these guys, just kind of uh -huh. get extra spawn, so it just kind of blew up really quick to the white. Which the last one that we did, the mycelium didn't eat near as fast. Yeah. Um, actually, have one shiitake that's growing inside the tent right now. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to try to do a tour inside the tent. Yeah. Uh, Pretty good, because uh, I would definitely involve uh, picking up the uh, the projection right now, and that might be interesting. Uh, yeah, it's we we show everything that we're doing. I mean, people spread the knowledge to us. We spread the knowledge um, as we're cooking, and you know, selling to the farmers market. We're not shy with what we do. We'll we'll post it on Facebook. We'll post it on our own. Um, Instagram post. So definitely, we're, talk, we're thinking about quite possibly doing some workshops here very soon to teach people or get them up to the, the point where we are if they want to be, or if they just want to like inoculate some logs, you know, keep them in the front, excuse me, in the front or backyard. Um, not everybody wants a big old grow tent in their basement. Um, we're just kind of the extreme of that. Just know that. You're not. No, <laughs> we're not. Everybody, everybody wants one. Everybody we're wants Christian. one. We, oh yeah, because oh, yeah. uh, um, we, uh, you know, we 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 were pushing the Prestos right up front, and I'm like, I'm looking at them like a Presto. No, I'm getting on the all American side, 
And that's what I did. I've been wanting to, looking for an excuse to get one of those uh, pressure canners for a long time. They're like 300 bucks, aren't they? Uh, 350. We got the 30 quart ones and um, we bought two of them. <laughs> nice. But, like, well, like I said, um, when we dive in this thing, I, we dive head first, especially me. I'm a chef. And uh, I don't know if, you know, people, I don't know how many interactions people have with chefs, but we love overkill when we do something. We do it all the way or we just don't do it. Yeah, so uh, you're, you're growing uh, shiitake. So I assume you're in your, you're in your room, your uh, colonization room right now. Uh, show us what else you have in there, what other species you're, you're growing now. I bet you got some oysters. species. This one's nice and pretty right now. There so this is. one we just did three days ago. Three days ago we did this one. So this is our chestnut blocks that we're doing right now. They take a little bit longer to inoculate than like the oyster species, but they like the cooler weather. So we're really hoping the weather is going to calm down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the two that we got going right now. A lot of our uh, Future ones are actually in the liquid cultures right now. We're we are. Some PC. We are uh, in the middle of going through and taking a look at our um, incubation room, and I think we're going to build a frame and put some paneling up here within the next month. Um, we got somebody a mushroom cult was nice enough to uh, um, lend us a hand. He's going to come down here um, this weekend kind of take a look at what we going on, what we have going on. Um, we're gonna put some fresh eyes to this because um, you know sometimes when you bury your head down into something, into a project that you're doing, and you build it, build it, build it, you get to a point where, okay, I need fresh eyes on this because I'm kind of stuck in my own head on this right now. Yeah. I have, you know, the people out there that are involved in, in this heavily kind of take a look at what you're doing and give you fresh ideas. And so um, on top of that, it's, um, we like to clean our tent um, regularly. And so we're getting ready to go through a thorough cleaning on that. So I'm flushing out um, the rest of what I have in my tent right now, our tent. And um, um, we're gonna go through all the racks, get them all completely sanitized, and uh, basically restart with the cooler weather species like the chestnuts. Um, we have kings in there uh, getting their flushing, getting ready to flush. Um, they like it a little bit cooler too. One of the things cultivating, you have to keep the temperatures kind of at a happy medium for a lot of the yeah. species. Kings like it a little bit on the cooler side. It's, it's um, you know, just look at it as a mathematical equation that you're constantly balancing and just when you think you're almost there, something comes around and makes you think about other things you didn't think about. Yeah, I've had really, uh, I, I have not had much luck growing the kings. I've tried, tried a few times and um, really kings and my takis have both uh, forwarded me. I got some of Lenny's black pearl kings last year and they were really easy to grow and they, they were like oysters, they were, they were foolproof. Uh, and they have that a lot of the same qualities the kings do, and um, it's um, they're a really meaty mushroom. That's one that I have been itching to grow this entire time. And honestly, I have a liquid culture um, down there of the black pearls that I can't wait to get going. Oh um, yeah, do it. With myself as a mushroom lover, you know, you watch, um, you know, as cultivators you're on spend a lot of time researching I, I don't care how much you learn there's always more to learn and you, you know you watch what other people are doing and you get on uh, um, other mushroom growers cultivators like mossy creek mushrooms they're really good about showing people what they're good videos doing. oh great videos yeah we got a question from rick about cleaning um before we do that though how about um how about this uh what are some good, for people that want to do this and get started um, and grow some mushrooms, I'm curious what tips you would, you would provide to, you know, Joe Schmo that, yeah, I, I want to try this. 
I always recommend if you want to start trying a few different things is to do the straw inoculations with oyster mushrooms, mainly because it is one of the easiest, most aggressive species. Uh, then, then move on from there if you enjoy it. Uh, a lot of the thing with the, because we do uh, the mushroom grow kits with the oyster species and straw, mainly because people can put it into the bag and they can sit it on their kitchen counter and it's works. It's something that you don't have to have an entire operation for. You can do pasteurization on the straw. If you do it that way, then you don't have to worry about airborne contaminants near as much and it just makes it flow so much easier. There's lots of cultivators putting out grow kits out there. And, um, you know, buy, buy from someone in your local area so that way you can ask some questions and that they can be a little bit more deeply involved. And, um, you know, study the way the mycelium grows. You know, don't, don't just look at the way the mushroom uh, pops out. Study the way the patterns, how it kind of, you know, grows out. And then kind of think to yourself, how far do I really want to take this? What is my ultimate goal behind this? Because you're going to get pushed into it quite a bit. And, you know, people are going to start talking about uh, specialized bags with micro and there's, you know, you're just talking about pressure sterilizing and pasteurizing techniques. So make that decision for yourself. Is this something that's just going to be a random hobby? Or is this something that I'm really going to be interested in furthering? Because much like mushroom sports, with the right conditions, things can blow up real quick. You know, like it's starting, uh, our first mushroom was in a cardboard box and thinking about it now with everything I've learned and know now, those mushrooms shouldn't have grown. They shouldn't have. I took coffee grounds that were literally a day old. I'm like, well, they've been sitting in the pot, so they should wait. And then I inoculated the oyster spawn that we had from it. I put that in a cardboard box that wasn't pasteurized, wasn't sterilized, and I took potting soil and put it all around. I didn't know any different. That was literally a three-way stage for contamination central. Yeah, oyster didn't care though. We, we it said didn't that happen. Lot. You've heard about the honey badger. Kristen and I say pleurotus don't care. Yeah, they don't. And so there was, you. there was no contamination. I couldn't, like, I can't believe it to this day. There was no no trick. Um, none of that, none of your typical molds that are, you know, that you see um, when you didn't follow through with your sterilizing or pasteurizing techniques. And um, they grew big. And they actually started eating the whole box. box. The whole box started just becoming one myceliated mat. Nice. Um, nice. That's how we got started. We looked at each other and we're like, this is cool. How far are we going to take this? And then next thing you know, we were on the All American website yeah. and we were sourcing a flow hood. And yeah, I would I would tell people that we're starting like like you were saying, uh, it's really nice if you can buy some um, some mushroom blocks ready to go and maybe you know try a couple different ones. I, I we, we we didn't have any locally. I ordered them online from uh, Mushroom Mountain and uh, had you know lion's mane and oysters and maitake. Uh, I think I got that from somewhere else too. Um, and that was fun for the first couple months. I just did that and and then went from there. But uh, that that's a nice way to start, like you were talking about. Get some some mushroom bags from a local. Now, let me jump into Rick's question here to back up. He said, how do you go about deep clean with such a large with such large equipment? Is it a cleaning solution or do you do a heat sterilization? Um, we actually have oh we have hydrogen peroxide, we have 70% alcohol. Um, we also use um, a 70, 30% vinegar solution. Um, we, so it's definitely multiple um, cleaning agents out there uh, you know, to help you out with that. 
We'll basically shut down the tent, pull all the raw um, racks out. We'll yank those outside and spray them down and scrub those down, bring them back in and kind of hit them with the alcohol and, uh, you know, make sure we're not carrying anything back into the tent with them. Um, most of our uh, intakes have uh, filters on them. We're actually, hopefully, uh, any time now, um, we have some new intakes coming in. These are going to be air conditioned from AC Infinity. And uh, it comes with a whole kit that we could put a probe in the tent to monitor everything. Humidity, yeah. heat. Uh, they're supposed to be able to do heat as well. So that would be awesome. So your, winter. Yeah. your job isn't growing mushrooms. Your job is cleaning. You have to get used to it. Your job is sterilizing, pasteurizing, cleaning, wiping down day in, day out, every five to six, like it's, it becomes assistive, compulsive. And then hopefully, hopefully mushrooms are a byproduct of that. So I did get my phone set up so that we can go into the tent real quick. Oh, great. I am gonna go with my mask so that I don't inhale a whole bunch of spores since we have some things growing right now. So give me just one sec. Yes, well, gonna show you. Talk about the mask there while she's putting that on. Tell everybody sure. what she's doing. Um, so this is the mask that I use. Mine's a little bit overdone on the filters. I have uh, vapor filters on my mask. It keeps uh, the spores, which mushrooms, we all know produce millions and millions and billions of spores. Um, it keeps them from going into my lungs. And so um, we are with that never, ever, ever I mean, that's, you gotta also take that into consideration too. Um, you know, if people have breathing asthma or, you know, any health conditions, in your house, um, is the mushroom spores going to be, because it's, it's unavoidable, you're gonna get some. Um, not everyone can be 100%, um, you know, we try. We actually have hooked up another six inch pan to kind of help us um, pull out excess spores just in case some got released into our lab, or, you know, this is basically our basement that we turned into a grow off it was unfinished okay. um, so she this, just uh, cleaned her feet didn't she I did. she did yes so the it's one of the biggest things is that we take every precaution possible um not to bring contaminants in it happens eventually your blocks basically are ticking time bombs for contaminants your basic goal is to get as beautiful and as much flushes out of them as possible before they turn over to contam. And then once at that point, um, those blocks become compost um, for the farm. Okay, here, see if she can, I think she's going to uh, take over here. Let's see how it goes. Are you heading over to the shiitakes? Uh, uh, I'm going to start on this side. Uh, we have four oysters growing on this side. And then we just harvested most of our lion's mane today. So this is what we have right now. This little guy is going to end up growing to be about this big. Oh, show him so I have this little one right here. And I'll let you know about the shiitake that we're growing. That's the little guy right there. And then we got another one. And we're going. Our kings have not yet quite made it through their masking yet. And the lion's mane will eventually get to be about like that. It's not bigger. Nice, that one looks almost ready to go. Oh, uh, I, I'd like to think so, but honestly, I think that one might wind up being a two pounder. Um, when you're rowing, um, and you're looking at an inoculated block when the mycelium, especially in the Herkia, uh, Herstian species, um, starts really building at the top like that. 
most of the time it'll kind of look like this. Um, and then it'll start fruiting where you expose it to the oxygen. Um, really just starts building up that myceliated mat. That's when we notice that it's eaten a lot. That's when we notice that, you know, it takes its time and it kind of builds up and then it really pushes out those one to two pounders. Okay. Now we have a question from Linda. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you for that little tour there, Tammy. No worries. Um, uh, and she has one about her indoor blue oyster mushroom kit that it bloomed three times indoors and then she transferred it to a garden bed outside that has wood shavings, coffee grounds and cardboard. Um, which by the way, that's, um, I save all my blocks all winter. I just leave them in my garage. Um, and then uh, I took mine and I've just laid them out in rows in my, in my garden and put uh, uh, straw over them. And my sprinkler hits them uh, once or twice every day. And I'm surprised they, they spend the summer kind of shooting up more mushrooms, uh, often all summer. Um, and then I move them to compost. Um, and even if they go kind of bad, I still save them and, and put them in there. And it's surprising how many they produce. Now, um, uh, I usually just let them go because they're kind of fun that, at that point to watch rather than kind of pick my outside mushrooms that are in, in straw. She said, it is an open bed though. How do you know if your mushrooms are contaminated and what contaminates do you look out for when they're indoors? I think that's the, the question there is, you know, what are you looking for contamination wise? Yeah. Well, the indoor, the biggest two contaminators that we've had problems with uh, is the first one is trick. Uh, the term, uh, uh, I forget the full scientific uh, term for it. Most most growers know as trick. Um, I call it the green monster because that's really going to be your primary um, thing that you're looking for after your, whether or not you're pasteurizing or sterilizing your substrate. Um, after about four days, I start feeling a lot more confident that the block is going to inoculate fully. Because um, we pasteurize only, um, we don't sterilize our blocks. We use the uh, lipas technique. Um, basically, uh, we take our um, hardwood pellets, bring to a boil to 172 degrees, um, if not a little bit further past that, and uh, we add that boiling water to our bags with the hardwood fill pellets. We give them a good mix. Mm -hmm over to kind of protect the filter because we bought three metal trash cans big ones that worked we found out that worked really well um and pack them in there nicely and then wrap it with saran wrap and cover those with military grade blankets so we're only doing pasteurization because we really want those heat resistant microbes to help our mycelium grow the other one that we have witnessed and come across is uh it's called cobweb mold so it looks a lot like my mycelium because uh, it is white, but it starts like going over the top of it. Uh, those, both of those contaminants still exist outside. You're still, your mushrooms are going to be contaminated if they're outside. Those uh, spores do exist everywhere. Um, there's no way to get rid of them no matter how much we wish we could, but they're also a decomposer just like mushrooms are. But the cool part about doing an outdoor like garden bed or using your spent blocks in your garden bed is one the mycelium does still grow it's still i mean they came from the wild to begin with so they just they have this little battle thing that ends up going on they still end up producing mushrooms the difference is though when we do our cultivation technique we want to make sure we're producing enough mushrooms to feed everybody Whereas outside, normally that's done to help support your plants and to be like a little fun thing to have a snack on or just watch grow. Yeah, that's, I would say the same thing. Mine did not produce, if, if I had to make a, a living from those outdoor ones, I, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, and they, um, I also did, uh, I, I moved them then. So I ran them all last year or, or run them in the summer. And in the spring, when I put them in my compost pile, they're like filled with worms and bugs and like, they're just like prime compost. They're really good for the Perfect. garden. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's actually why we sell our spent, like we keep some of our spent blocks obviously because we love, you know, just having mushrooms pop up in the backyard. 
but we do sell them to gardeners and to uh, other bigger farms so that they can have that for their composting. Yeah, so Linda clarified she was interested in the outdoor contaminants. I think the answer is that's just, you can't really, they are. Can't really control it, Bob. I think the biggest thing that you can do, I think that is, um, if you want to give your outdoor beds a little bit more success, I would pasteurize the wood chips, inoculate them with the oyster uh, mycelium, or you know what you're planning, and letting that mycelium grow as strong as possible, and then um, plant that outside. That's going to give your outdoor grills the best possible chance, because once you put them out there. It's, it's a war. I mean, like, we don't know what they're, you know, there's everything and anything out there. But is a very aggressive one, and they, they tend to be the winners in most battles. People do do the outdoor uh, oyster beds that they make specifically out of straw itself. But again, it's a pasteurization process to help protect the mycelium. You don't want to sterilize that. One of my favorite inoculation techniques for outdoors is logs. You know, it's a little time consuming. Um, you have to um, keep the logs um, kind of somewhere safe for a little while encased in like a, a plastic bag and a little breathing port. But it's really worth it um, if you inoculate um, wood plugs in those logs and let that mycelium just kind of hold in there. It could be six months, it could be a year. You know, you check on your mycelium and make sure they're, they're, they're breathing and whatnot. And then as soon as you pull that, my, you know, that whole log is inoculated. And then you can uh, place that in your backyard kind of like halfway in your soil. And you don't have to worry about contaminants at, um, at that point in time because that's, that's the territory that's already taken over. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, we're kind of getting, getting um, near the end here. Uh, can we jump over? You had you made some food to share, and I have a picture too. I wish yeah, you could let's, share. Uh, a, let's shoot the picture. Okay. But um, yeah, I made an indigenously inspired dish. It's a little bit rough to see, um, you know, trying to get up to the camera. Um, but it's basically um, seared coho salmon finished in the oven with um, Peruvian roasted style potatoes. Um, we bought some uh, chanterelle and lobster mushrooms from uh, Intel Farm and Foods. And um, I, I took the pumpkin puree, smeared it on the plate. And then we took some uh, dandelion greens and I made a maple mustard vinaigrette. Made sure the skin, the skin on there was nice and crispy. Um, I did not um, put a whole lot of seasoning on the mushrooms. I put salt and pepper on it. Um, because I just really wanted to hide, uh, highlight the floral naturalness of the lobsters and the chanterelles. Both those flavors are two of my favorite from the wild. And then um, I added some um, dehydrated wild huckleber um, huckleberries, some roasted pepitas. So this is more of my line along the lines of what I think of an indigenously inspired food using ingredients from the Americas, this land here. Um, uh, there are lots of indigenous chefs out there like Sean Sherman and Brian Yazzie, Nephi Craig. Um, you know, they're, they're sporting their cultures. They, they're farmers, they're foragers. And, um, you know, they're, 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 they're bringing this kind of food and their respective cultures to life utilizing these ingredients. And this is um, the ingredients that I really love to work with um, because it's the healthy stuff. You know, like when we go foraging, it's like she said, it's some berries here, some mushrooms here, a little bit of this, give me some of those rose hips. And next thing you know, I'm putting together a, a fine dining, you know, plate right sitting right there in the mountain and we're munching on this stuff and it's healthy and you know i'm not i'm not trying to be the, the snake oil guy here but this is like if you're looking to boost your immunity during times of pandemics or 
um, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you want to introduce into your diet. And on top of that, um, with these different tribes highlighting their, their cultures, like um, the Dana in uh, basically the Navajo in northern Arizona, um, they, they have food um, systems, you know, different companies that I support through my, cre you know, creative aspects with this cuisine. So I'm able to not only eat healthy, utilize foraging. I'm a chef, so I can definitely get creative with it. There's no butter in this dish. There's, there's nothing uh, traditionally that has come over from Europe. Potatoes are from the Americas, dandelion greens, salmon, you can get that up and down the coast, squash. Everything is from this continent. It highlight, highlights the flavors and the different respective cultures that spent the time teaching us how to eat these things. You know, uh, Kristen put that in there. We'd love if you want to do a blog post about that. Um, with a, yeah, with a, definitely. Love to have that on our on our blog and publish it there. If you have the, the time to put that together, that that looks yeah, delicious, absolutely. and it's a it's really a compelling way to eat. Um, you know, local local food is one of our biggest things is balance in the restaurant industry. It does not exist. Um, there was a point in time when I was 20 years old. I was, to be honest with you, I was popping Vicodins and um, drinking bourbon to get through 13 to 14 hour shifts, you know, as a young culinary student. There's no balance. Um, I think we're at that point in time in this country um, generally universal energies have all come together where people are looking for that balance in their life, that quality of life. So I always tell them, learn what's in your backyard to eat, get creative with it, um, because it not only includes exercise, it includes healthy eating that will just bring balance to your life without you realizing it. Are there, are there any places there near you in the Boulder area that you recommend for, for people that want to have this, this kind of experience? There's not many. Uh, Tacombe, I believe that's the name of the restaurant in Denver. Um, there's not many here in Colorado. If you're down into the Mancos area, uh, Baca, um, he reps the, the U, uh, um, Can you say his name again? Carlos Baca. Carlos Baca? Yeah, and he represents the, the he's the kind of the chef for the youth down there. Um, I'm sure that like he holds lots of events. Um, and I think that's one of my biggest problems is that this isn't a mainstream idea just yet. Other chefs, um, you know, and they're like the, the Lakota, Sean Sherman, he put out a really awesome James Beard award winning book um, the sous chef, uh, indigenous kitchen, and there's all kinds of, you know, we're just looking your local areas, but for the Boulder area, no, none of it, that, that's kind of been a lifelong goal of mine. And I think that's um, really gonna kind of be the main outcome for us here at Mycenae, that the mushroom operation is a um, component in this greater culinary experience that I'm going to, we're going to open ourselves within the Boulder area because there is nothing like it. Well, we'll line up to be like your, your first customers. We'll, we'll, we'll come and do it. What if we want to try to um, get some of your mushrooms uh, there in Boulder or, or, you know, support you and try some of your products? Are you, are you at a farmer's market now or? Farmer's market ended, it was, this is the second, actually, this is the second Thursday that the farmer's market's been over. We still take orders online or you can send messages through Facebook. Um, we do do deliveries within the local area between Lafayette, Erie, um, and parts of Longmont. Okay, and we can maybe look forward to some chestnuts and shiitakes coming soon, Lion's Mane. Oh yeah, we are, we're getting ready to lay it down. I think uh, I'm just gonna dive in real deep here over the winter, especially going into making liquid cultures um, doing agar plants and stuff. We're yeah. uh, cultivate those blue woods, get those going. Um, for me, I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm a chef. So whatever I can get away with 
um, you know, cultivating for not only myself, but for others to try out most definitely. Um, to be honest with you, cultivating mushrooms was um, a purpose thing from our minds when we were, when we started doing this, we wanted to open up a restaurant um, and COVID hit. I was almost ready to sign for a bank loan um, right before uh, COVID hit to open up a restaurant and something told me not to do it. And um, so I kind of just proceeded with this and worked some gigs for a little while to uh, build up the support for this. Um, and this is just kind of taken on a life of its own and we love it. And we're just going to keep riding with it and see where it goes. I actually did two deliveries today to two awesome customers. And uh, the third one was a, uh, a drop off to us. It was the Belitz, or not the Belitz, the Bullet. Bluets. The Bluets, yes. Yeah. Um, we, we got, we didn't case people in the Erie area, which was uh, historically kind of a little bit more conservative. So, you know, mushrooms weren't exactly at the top of their list, but it's been going really well. They've engaged us. We've gotten a lot of people that wanted to learn. We've been able to teach a lot of people that keep trumpets are one of the best mushrooms to throw on your steaks. And uh, we will feeding people's stomachs, and through that, we'll, we'll be able to touch their hearts and their minds and continue. Okay, okay. Are you um, doing any uh, delivery of prepared foods as well, or are you are you exclusively on the, the, the fresh mushrooms right now? Not quite yet on the food, because it's a food handling license that we need to take care of. We got to go through the health department on everything, and with all the COVID stuff right now. They are so backed up. We're just kind of letting it settle down a little bit. But you know, if uh, somebody, I'm not opposed to, you know, I've done private shopping in the past and if somebody wants me to come out to their house and, um, you know, uh, cook for um, a few guests and whatnot, we're very capable of doing that safely. Um, I've been in the restaurant industry for 25 years. She's been in the restaurant industry for 14. We've opened up uh, some pretty high-end restaurants. Um, I helped open up uh, and work at Black Belly Market in Boulder for two and a half years. I think I was there working their uh, chef's counter. That's uh, Jose Rosenberg's restaurant. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he's one of Boulder's local chefs. He won Top Chef season five. And uh, that was definitely a culinary experience in itself too. So we were definitely open to doing the uh, prepared foods. We were just kind of sitting back, um, waiting for the right time to get that done. Yeah. Well, gosh, keep keep following your passions, and you know, if you can find a, a way to do what you love and 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 make a living from it, that's that's the that's the dream. It, you know, it is. I I believe that to be true, and I feel we are lucky in my book. Um, you know, to me, a lot of you know, historically speaking, pandemics have been. Um, a time for innovation, you know, and unfortunately, yes, you know, but a lot of the times that actually provided some of the most innovative point in times in our history. Um, so for me to be locked in this house um, for as long as we were putting together this grow, um, it was innovative to say the least, and we are just gonna keep riding the wave. Right, all right. I think I think we'll sign off here and uh, let's stay in touch. Maybe uh, offline, I'd love to talk to you about your cultures and maybe we can do a little a little swap on a few uh, genetics down the road if you're interested. Because I'm oh big time, big time yeah. on that one. Well, yeah, we're, we've been waiting to look. Thank you guys so much for doing this. We've been waiting to hang out with you guys yeah. and hopefully in person on some level. Yeah, yeah. certainly uh, we'll be out pretty hard here in the spring and late spring when the hopefully the morels come up and hopefully we'll be chasing some bird morels around uh western colorado here um uh once the, the the rains come next spring but uh otherwise if we're out in boulder we'll make sure we we give you guys a call and and uh uh try to hook keep up. spreading the spores spread the love stay passionate enjoy life it's too short to not love it and, and just uh, enjoy what you do Thanks for all the attendees. I see a lot of you in there signing off and saying thanks. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys came in today. And uh, uh, we do have a couple of new webinars coming up next week. We're talking with Zach 
Zachary Mazzi, and uh, he's in Thailand right now, and he's a, a super talented chef, and he uh, uh, loves mushrooms deeply. That'll be a fun conversation. And then the week after that, we're talking with Joseph Crawford, one of, uh, one of the, uh, our friends we've known for years, and he knows a lot about Matsutake, and we're going to do an entire webinar on nothing but Matsutake. Which is exciting. oh you're gonna yeah you're definitely gonna see us because we we <laughs> yeah, found our love those guys. yeah we found those guys up in these hills so I'd love to see that yeah we we love that that's one of our favorite mushrooms certainly one of mine so uh, if we don't catch you there we'll 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 catch you offline anyways and hopefully see you see you both in person soon Th thank Thanks you a everybody. lot Trent thank you Kristen for everything.